to uh, our book review for today. It's going to be Operation Chastise. That's uh, by Max Hastings. He's a British uh, uh, military writer of some renown. And, and uh, uh, you may not know what Operation Chastise is. I didn't when I saw that. And then I saw, oh, this is the Dam Busters. That's the name that some journalist gave it, the Dam Busters. And uh, that ended up being the, the book of 1951 about that by Paul Brickle. And then the, the movie that was made in the mid-50s with, uh, uh, basically with Richard Todd called The Dam Busters. It's, it's probably the most popular British war movie ever made. Uh, well, this is, this is the uh, 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. We just celebrated the end of the war in Europe last month. Uh, September 2nd will commemorate the end of the war in the Pacific. Uh, 75 years. And, and, and of all the actions that were undertaken in terms of raids and surprise kinds of thrusts, um, the, the Dam Busters raid was probably one of the most interesting. It's, it's British. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that were done by uh, the Brits that were um, reappropriated by us in our movies later. Uh, like The Great Escape. Of course, The Great Escape was actually a, uh, a British escape from Stalag Luth III uh, that was entirely British with the exception of maybe one American involved or a very small handful. Uh, but we made it look like an American operation. The same with the movie U U571, uh, which is about the U-110 uh, capture of the, the German submarine that had the Enigma coding machine on it. Uh, we made it look American. It was a British operation. Uh, uh, and so a lot of these British operations get lost in our own national pride, and we say we did them. But this one is definitely a British operation, uh, Operation Chastise. Um, operation Chastise uh, was the brainchild originally of, a, of an engineer named Barnes Wallace. Uh, Barnes Wallace in the early 40s was looking at how you could prepare special kinds of bombs that could take out dams. Um, it, it technologically didn't seem doable uh, that early in the war, although even German scientists had talked about the potentiality of that happening with some of the great German dams as late as the 1930s. But it was just considered not possible. Uh, the British were actually looking for something at this point in time to, to stem what had been a series of defeats uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, Americans were always asking Churchill, what have you accomplished? And, and not much had been accomplished. The thing that was being accomplished by the, by the uh, later in 42, early in 43, was the mass bombing of Germany by, by uh, both British and American bombers. So the British really only had one really affirmative thing before El Alamein in North Africa. They had one affirmative thing, and that was all the bombing that went on in the German cities. The British bombed at night, and uh, the American Air Force, it was then the Army Air Corps, uh, bombed during the day. I have a personal family interest in this. My, my grandfather, Colonel Stanford, was the uh, chief signal officer for the 8th Bomber Command. He worked out of High Wycombe, where some of these British people worked, as the U.S. Air Force bombed during the day and the British bombed during the night the German cities. He integrated the radio communications between the Royal Air Force uh, and uh, 8th Bomber Command. Uh, I have been interested, though, in this Dam Busters raid since I was a little boy because I grew up watching that movie, and it is a great movie and, and uh, uh, tells how, how that surprise operation was brought off. Uh, it's just one of those great war stories. I think at some point I want to do pretty quickly uh, a review of Craig Nelson's book on, on the Doolittle Raid, which was our raid in uh, early 1942 that basically bombed Tokyo, much to the Japanese surprise. Uh, I'm going to do that one. But today's operation chastised the damn busters. And, and uh, what I thought I'd do is talk about, uh, talk about uh, all the crazy things that were surfacing trying to figure out some way that the British could fight back against the Germans who had been bombing uh, London and, and uh, uh, Barnes Wallace uh, 
it says, was only one amongst a host of enthusiastic inventors peddling ambitious schemes to the armed forces. Lord Cherwell, the British Prime Minister's favorite scientist, railroaded into the experimental stage an absurd scheme for frustrating enemy aircraft with barrages of aerial mines. Lord Louis Mountbatten, as Director of Combined Operations, sponsored a scheme for creating aircraft carriers con constructed from ice blocks. Barnes Wallace attempted to persuade the Royal Navy to adopt a smoke-laying glider of his invention. The Americans conducted experiments in fitting incendiary devices to bats to be dispatched over enemy territory in abortive operation codenamed X-Ray. Evelyn Waugh's description in his satirical novel put out more flags of Whitehall recruiting a witch doctor to cast spells on Hitler did not range far beyond reality. Aircraft designer Norman Boer said there were many, many crazy ideas being put forward by all sorts of scientists because the problem was the, 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 uh, uh, the, the British were so low on resources and, and uh, uh, were, were trying to fight a war against what was basically a German war machine on the offensive. Uh, and so uh, coming up with these ideas was something that was uh, important. Most of them were just uh, eccentric. But the Barnes-Wallace idea turned out to be really important. Um, the movie, as the author of this book tries to tell over and over again, the movie uh, did not do credit to the British military operation. It made it seem as though Barnes Wallace had to fight against resistance uh, based on, on the fact that uh, nobody believed in it. It wasn't so much that as it was that he had to fight against a shortage of, of uh, resources that caused the, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy and, and the ground forces to have to prioritize what they could do. Now there was one person who was opposed from the very beginning to this whole thing and it was, it was uh, Air Marshal uh, Arthur Harris. Arthur Harris uh, was at High Wycombe also. He was the head of Bomber Command. He served under the Chief Air Marshal Charles Portal Portal headed the entire air operation. Portal did not necessarily believe in mass bombing of German cities. He looked more toward targeting, uh, targeted bombings. But the accuracy of those bombings was not all that great. And so uh, Air Marshal uh, Harris, Bomber Harris, was able to convince most folks that, that uh, mass bombing of German cities was the way to go. And so when this proposition from Barnes Wallace came before uh, Bomber Harris. Uh, Air Marshal Harris basically thought it was kind of cracked and, and didn't want to have anything to do with it. Portal was interested. Um, but Bar Barnes Wallace forged ahead with the help of a man who never gets any credit in the movie or, or in most sources uh, named Arthur Collins. Arthur Collins was at, at one of the, uh, at, at a test site where they, they tested bombs effect on masonry and concrete and those sorts of things. And it was, it was basically Arthur Collins that was able to finally determine that Barnes Wallace's idea could work and suggest ways that it could work uh, in the, at these test sites uh, because, because it, was, it was believed to be impossible to bomb these, these German dams. Uh, why would they even want to bomb German dams? Well, they particularly wanted to bomb the German dams in the Ruhr River Valley because, uh, because the Ruhr had all these industries. It was hard to pinpoint bomb these industries, but they had all these industries up and down the Ruhr that depended on the water power from the Ruhr River and from all the reservoirs uh, up the Ruhr, including the great Monsey uh, Reservoir, which was a big masonry reservoir, the the Aid Era, smaller but still substantial reservoir uh, up, up river and then, and it was actually on a different river, uh, and the Sorpa, uh, which was a masonry dam. Those were the big three that the Royal Air Force would love to, to take out. But, and in, by 1942, uh, with, with Collins fine-tuning Barnes Wallace's ideas, they came to the conclusion that they could do that. Uh, the question was how to do that what kind of bomb, what kind of size, how you put it against the dam to, to basically destroy 
uh, the dam. The whole point is to cause the dam to collapse, the water to rush down the, the river uh, with the Monsi, it's, it's the, uh, the Ruhr River, uh, and rush all the way down, uh, take out industries, deprive water, stop war production in that area of Germany. And so that was the plan. Uh, it got a little more traction uh, when, in addition to Charles Portal, the ch chief air marshal, um, the, the first Lord of the Admiralty, Dudley Pound, uh, was shown that the kind of bombs they were talking about could also be dropped from ships to, to hit the sides of, of uh, it could drop from planes to hit the sides of ships and then explode on the side of the ship and sinking the ship. And so now all of a sudden you had uh, Arthur Harris's superior, Charles Portal, and you had the first Sea Lord, Dudley Pound, interested in whether or not this could really be done. Uh, it's, it's two different operations. Uh, um, upstart was, was the bombs against the dam. Uh, highball was to drop smaller bombs into the ocean against ships. And both these went forward. We know the upstart operation because that's the dam busters operation. But basically, much over uh, Harris's objections, um, it went forward. Uh, there was all kinds of testing that was done. The, the questions became whether or, not you could, whether or not you could stay at a certain height, which you couldn't. It got lower and lower and lower. Before this was over with, these bombers were going to be asked to drop to 60 feet above the surface of a lake and to drop a bouncing bomb at a certain distance that would hit the wall of the dam, drop and ignite at the base of the dam to, to cause it to collapse and the water to come out. Uh, that's, that's what was dealt with over and over and over again and they had all kinds of problems. What kind of bomber could do this? Uh, now, in addition to that, they had one big problem, and that was that Barnes Wallace uh, worked for Vickers, uh, the British uh, aircraft company. Vickers was perfecting the Windsor bomber, uh, which, was a, which was a bomber that uh, needed to get into production. And so they, they basically resented the time Barnes Wallace spent working on this project that he should have been working for Vickers, but he did both. And, and basically, uh, with, with Collins' help, they perfected a a, a bomb, it looks, it looks kind of like, it, it bounced on the water, it looks kind of like a big oil can or something. Uh, they originally put it in, in, in a wooden case, but uh, if you dropped it from the wrong height, the wooden case would break and the, the thing would just sink. And so you had to create a bouncing bomb and, and it had to bounce, so it had to bounce a certain distance, hit the dam, drop to the bottom, ignite, explode. So you, you had some really refined flying that had to be done just above the water. You had to drop a bomb just at the right point away from the dam, and they had to create all these sophisticated navigational devices between lights and, and various kinds of devices to tell the, the bomber when to drop the bomb at that exact moment, because otherwise it would be too far away from the dam or it, would, it just wouldn't work. Um, and these people, keep in mind, were being asked to fly at 60 feet above the level of, of these lakes. And let's talk about what they were flying and how this bomb was mounted in it. Um, they were flying about the biggest bomber uh, in, the, in the British repertoire, and that was the Avro Lancaster. They were flying Lancaster bombers, seven crew bombers, great big old things. So you're taking this great big thing right above the level of the lake to drop these bombs and at just the right place to bounce them, hit the wall, drop, and ignite. Um, and they were going to be asked to do that at night. Um, and they were going to have to do that on a moonlit night. Uh, generally, these mass bombing raids over Germany, the, the Royal Air Force carried out by day, uh, by night. We bombed, the U.S. bombed by day. These night raids, they didn't want a moon. They wanted it to be dark. Uh, and so a lot of moonlit nights, they chose not to take these big bombing raids over German towns. But 
but this had to be moonlit in order to see what they were doing. A very dangerous mission. Uh, and how did they figure out uh, what these reservoirs looked like? They used tourist postcards and books from the period, anything they could get. Most of these dams had been built around the turn of the century or shortly after that. And, and they just had old pictures. It would turn out later with the Adair that they didn't have adequate pictures. It was a lot more mountainous and difficult to get down in that little mountain basin than they had thought. But that's what they worked off of. So you're going to go in on a moonlit night right over the water. Uh, what kind of defenses are you going to encounter? Well, you can expect German flak guns on the, on the dams. You can expect searchlights. They weren't quite sure whether you could expect uh, uh, s some, kind of, some kind of netting or some kind of uh, uh, balloons that might tangle your plane. Uh, they weren't quite sure what they would encounter on those dams. Well, uh, the green light is finally given to this operation. Barnes Wallace and Arthur Collins and others have taken the uh, Pound and Portal and Harris out and let them watch uh, examples of these things being dropped and, and see the possibilities th that could, could actually now work that two years before nobody thought could work. And so basically after all this testing they have to start assembling the equipment. Let, I said a, a Lancaster is a big plane. They didn't have Lancasters to spare. So what they did is set aside three Lancasters uh, and they had to fit them specially for this raid. Um, they had to be real careful because once you did this raid, whether it worked or not, the Germans were going to be ready at the other dams after that. They were, going to, they were going to know this could be done and they were going to make it really impossible to fly big bombers against these dams. And so they had to make it work the first time with a big airplane, low, and it had to be specially fit because these oil canister looking things that, that were, were being dropped were held in calipers. So you had to modify the Lancasters uh, to have an open bomb bay and below it a, a caliper that's holding a bomb. And the bomb has to be rotated before it's dropped. So what you had was an airplane that had a, a, a bomb and it's being rotated on these calipers for most of this trip into, into the heart of Germany uh, and then dropped. So, so, I mean, it's the most obviously clunky kind of thing you can think of. You, you look at pictures sometimes of one of these dam busters planes with the, with the bomb underneath it held by calipers and know that that bomb was rotating and had to be rotated before it was dropped. So all this was necessary. And so you get a couple, three, three or so Lancasters, and you start retrofitting them to test all this stuff. You start refining the bomb to make sure it works. And all this is happening within a couple months before the raid. I mean, this is all pretty much last minute stuff. And so basically you, you, you have to now have a crew that can do that. Now, where do you get RAF pilots that are capable of that kind of precision piloting? Well, that's where Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, that's where he did make his contribution. He would later take credit for this, these raids as though he had thought them up and, and encouraged them all along when he had been the chief impediment to them. But when, when, when the go came from Portal, uh, then, then, then they needed to retrofit the plane but they needed great crews. And basically, uh, Arthur Harris chose from some of the finest uh, flying squadron folks that, that were around. Uh, the head of this operation was to be a guy named Guy Gibson. Guy Gibson's the role that uh, Richard Todd played in, in the Dam Busters. But Guy Gibson was the, basically was the uh, veteran of, believe this or not, 70 two missions already. Um, you know, our, our pilots flew 25 missions and then were rotated and may never fly any more again. Uh, most of them didn't make 25 missions, unfortunately. Um, uh, another personal uh, 
piece of this that makes me always interested is I am, I was born in 1949, I was named after my uncle who went down with his entire crew in 1944. He was a pilot of an American B-24 bombing the German oil fields in Romania. And so uh, the lifespan of people who did these kinds of uh, uh, bomber runs, uh, both U.S. and British, was very uh, short generally. And so, uh, but they, they, they got together almost 500 people uh, that Harris helped pick, uh, both as pilots and as crew and as, and as a ground crew and they were assigned to begin training at uh, RAF Scampton. Scampton is, is, was, was the base out of which they flew. Of course, there were bases all over England out of which bombers were flying all the time. Uh, but this was going to be a very specialized mission with very qualified pilots for the most part. The pilot group actually included one American. Uh, Joe McCarthy was uh, uh, an American who had tried to get into the uh, Army Air Corps, had been turned down. Uh, got uh, got into the Canadian uh, Flying Corps, and and th so with with the exception of him, all these people were Brits, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, and and they began this huge flying training operation from Scampton, dropping these things, testing them out. They had a limited number of these things, that w these bombs that were being made very quickly. Uh, what it ended up finally being was, was uh, uh, three waves of bombers. The first wave had three groups in it of three planes, so there were nine in that first wave that Guy Gibson went out with. There was a second wave that went to the Sorpa. That went to the Mona. There was a second wave that went to the Sorpa, uh, and, and the first wave, once they finished with the Mona, were supposed to bomb the Adair. And then there was a reserve wave of five planes uh, that was to mop up anything that needed to be mopped up afterwards. And so you're talking about 19 airplanes. And let me tell you right now, I'm going to do a kind of a spoiler. Uh, eight of them didn't come back. Uh, but that was kind of typical for a raid like this. Um, and every time one of those went down, uh, seven men went down with them. And, and in this case, there were two or three POWs who were taken, but uh, almost all the rest were killed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me talk about, uh, um, let's see if I can find the, uh, some quotes I wanted to read about what it was to be a pilot at this point in time in, in, uh, in the war in, in Germany. Now, uh, one thing I see in my notes that I did not mention is that, um, all this is being done in February and March of, of uh, 1943. They have to bomb in May. And it has to be a moonlit night. And the reason it has to be in May is because that's when the water is the highest in those reservoirs. So to do maximum damage, you need to take out those reservoirs in May. Uh, the, the ultimate date picked was the, the, the night of May 16, 1943. Uh, but let me do a couple readings of uh, what it was like to be a pilot in the RAF. Uh, and, and in some ways, this is a good description of what it was like to be a pilot in the uh, Army Air Corps for us, too. But let me read. Warship or tank crews lived and fought amid familiar environments and a relatively even tenor of discomfort. A unique aspect of the bomber war was that Harris's air crew spent most of their flying careers deep in the English countryside, drinking on stand downs in local pubs or dance halls, such as the glider drome in Boston, that's Boston in England. Then every few nights they were plunged into the hottest flame of battle over Germany. The revolving door between relative tranquility and desperate peril, parallel existences and violently contrasting environments imposed a special kind of strain. Think about what was just said there. Uh, it's one thing to be in a tank and to, or to be living as an infantryman out someplace day after day after day. These people were in civilized areas of England, not real pretty, but civilized, and they, they would lead a kind of a regular life of training, and then all of a sudden you're over Germany with, with a very small percentage uh, of, of chance of surviving in so many instances. So you go from, from tranquility to 
to the awful battle of the air war over Germany uh, in just a few moments. You get in a plane, you fly over Germany. It, that is a special kind of strain. Um, I want to read about the bases, too. Bomber bases were desolate places, as observed by Henry Treese. Expanses of grass, concrete, huts and hangars occupied by a permanent population of up to 1,500 ground crew, administrators, parachute packers, mess staff, service police, fire teams, armorers, medics, and officers, batmen, who enjoyed the privilege of relatively safe, if austere, wartime experiences. They worked hard in all weathers, but they were overwhelmingly likely to survive. Their functions were to support 300-odd birds of passage from two squadrons who were likely to die. The flyers might spend seven or eight months at a given station, but would more plausibly vanish over Germany some night or another. In the spring of 1943, less than one man in five was completing a 30-trip tour of operations, and only 2.5% finished a second tour. No crew is recorded as having offered to Sir Arthur Harris the old Roman gladiator's farewell to the emperor, Morturi to Salus Thomas, we who are about to die salute you. But that was the way things were. Statistically, wartime British and American soldiers and sailors enjoyed odds heavily weighted in favor of coming through, while in 1943 the adverse prospect of bomber boys were matched only by those of submarine crews. I always wonder whether my uncle knew the extreme danger into which he was introduced in 1944 fresh from a flying, um, uh, if, the, if those young men really knew how likely it was that they were going to die, a lot of them came to understand that, particularly after they had done a few missions. But notice he said, second only to submarine crews in terms of fatalities. Um, I would add one thing he didn't add, that maybe the most fatality prone, all it was very small, uh, were the gliders. Uh, you know, gliders were carried behind behind aircraft and then dropped and they had to land wherever they were going to land. Uh, that was probably the highest uh, percentage of, of uh, death, uh, at least on the American side. So uh, gliders, bombers, submarines were worse than being a Marine on the ground. And so uh, I'll, I'll do another spoiler and tell you right now. Um, I've already told you that eight out of 19 airplanes did not return from these raids on the three dams, um, but I did, that's 57 pilots, 57 airmen, but I didn't mention that three quarters, 75 percent of all those people that participated in this raid did not survive the Second World War. They went on to other missions, including Guy Gibson. They went on to other missions and were killed. Three out of four were dead by 1945. Anyway, let's talk about how we deal with the, the, the training is dealt with now. They've done all this training, bombing, trying to work it out with dummies, um, getting themselves into a group that's led by Gibson. Uh, they've, up to this point, it's, it's interesting to remember, they didn't know where they were going. Up until the very end, they had no idea what they were headed for. They were just told to, to uh, to basically practice in a certain way and do certain sorts of runs with these dummy bombs. And so, so they don't know where they're going, but they know it's going to be bad. Um, and let's see, talk about uh, let's see if I can find what I want to see. Oh, uh, everything keeps getting dropped, too. Originally, this had started out as you have to come out 250 feet over the water, then it was 100 feet. Now it's 60 feet over the water in an Avro Lancaster. Can you imagine that great big plane? Uh, the margin of error is basically zero on any of this, on any of this stuff. And, and uh, so on the, on the night of the 16th of May, they load the bombs and the calipers, um, and, and they head out to bomb the dams. Um, They, one thing we don't think about, they had to be so careful about their route because as you crossed over the channel and hit the French coast uh, or, or the coast or, or Holland's coast, whichever route you took, um, 
all of a sudden you would be subject to German flak, searchlights, um, all kinds of things that could get you. And, and you may be 60 feet over the dam. You're not much more than 100 feet over the, over the uh, countryside. You come in very low. Otherwise, the Luftwaffe is going to get you. The, the great mystery of this night is that the Luftwaffe, when they got to the dams, did not, uh, did not scramble. But uh, they flew in at very low heights over the French and Dutch countryside coming in. Uh, three planes were actually shot down doing that. A couple of them had to return because they, were, they had been uh, either hit with fire or had some sort of engine difficulty. Uh, the three that went down, a couple of them were not flak. They were not shot down by the Germans. They hit power lines. When you're flying that low in that big an airplane, you are literally hopping over power lines. And, and so it is very important that you stay on your route. You have to watch that there's no wind drift that occurs. You have to navigate uh, so low that, that radio stuff is difficult. You have to literally navigate off a map on the ground, right next to the ground as you fly along, trying to jump power lines and church steeples and everything else you need to jump. And so they lost some ships uh, on, the way, on the way in. Uh, ironically, of the five who were to hit the Sorpe, uh, McCarthy, the Americans, uh, basically his plane was the only one that ever got to the Sorpe. Uh, the others were lost uh, on the way. And, and some were lost coming back. And so getting there and getting back is incredibly dangerous. Uh, so, okay, Guy Gibson and that first wave of airplanes shows up at the Mona. That was the biggest of the German reservoirs. It was masonry. Sat right on the right on the Mona River, right above the Ruhr. So if you can break that dam, that's the that's the truly important one. Uh, you can flood the Ruhr Valley and, and do what you need to do. So in they come and they begin their various bomb runs. Some uh, are basically shot at some I mean, planes are lost. Gibson, of all people, uh, was one that his crews didn't necessarily always like to fly with him because he was fearless. He, he kept going around and around and supervising this thing and trying different, trying different runs in on the dam because you had, to have just, you had to have the lights. They had a light system that had to converge. You had certain things that had to triangulate, and then the bomber could drop the bomb. It was a split-second piece that they had to carry out. 60 feet over the water, and then pull up not to run into the dam or run into mountains or hills nearby. And so over and over and over again they did this, drop bombs, some, uh, some were short, some didn't work, or th they weren't sure. Finally, and it's not quite sure whose bomb did this, but finally one of them, or maybe the cumulative effect of, of the ones that had been dropped that had actually fallen at the base of the dam, caused the Mona to crumble. And they could, uh, pulling out, they could see that, uh, that water was beginning to flood. Uh, the sad part of this, and, and a difficulty for uh, the pilots on this mission, um, because they hadn't even thought about this, they had a particular mission, was to know afterwards that about 1,400 people drowned down the Ruhr. Um, and about half of those were unfortunately uh, pinned up um, mainly women and women who were slave workers from Poland and Ukraine and other places. Uh, Germany was using slave workers in the Ruhr at this time, and so half of them were poor slaves from Eastern Europe that were killed. But what do you do? The whole point was to, was to crumble the infrastructure, uh, deprive the Ruhr industries of water, and, and also to knock down as much as, as a flood of water could knock down. And it did a great job all the way down the Ruhr, all the way to where the Ruhr goes into the Rhine. Uh, the, the water came down in great 40-foot wave of water uh, tumbled ahead. Um, and so they did crack the Mona. Uh, now, Gibson's group also went over to the Ader and basically were able to, to uh, finally also uh, basically breach the Ader Dam. Problem with the Ader was, as I said before, was there were mountains and some mountain, there was one mountain castle 
that really didn't show up in what they had. And so this was an exercise where you had to pull out so violently after you had dropped this pinpoint bouncing bomb uh, the, just to make sure that you did not hit that castle or hit the, the hills around. The Germans had really suspected nobody would attack the Ader if they attacked at all because it was so ringed uh, with mountains. And RAF didn't really realize that to that extent, but they got the Ader. They lost more planes. Uh, the Sorpa was the earthen dam. They had never figured out how to breach the Sorpa because it was constructed differently than the, than the uh, masonry dams a lot less likely to, to get it with a bomb. But as I said, McCarthy was the only plane on the Sorpa run that, that actually made it across Germany. Uh, and basically, he did run after run after run, finally dropped his bomb, hit it about right, but it was not enough to breach the Sorpa. So the Adair and the Mona, uh, the Mona say, uh, those are the two that got, uh, that got uh, collapsed. Uh, and the problem with the Ader is, is it was on a different river system, so it didn't quite have the impact of the Mona. But the whole point of all of this is it made a statement. The British needed a statement so badly at this time in the war. And it really did impair the German war effort, but for a very short time. But basically, um, the way back was not necessarily any more... Uh, any more easy than getting there. It, it had all the same dangers. Uh, the, the reserve wave, this is something that doesn't get set out in the movie, the reserve wave uh, had it hardest of all going over and coming back because by the time the reserve wave crossed over these uh, uh, German positions, which they tried to avoid, but there were just too many of them, they already knew because the other waves had come before them, they were ready. The reserve wave got a lot more flack and got a lot more searchlights and got a lot more of everything and had, had more fatalities than the others, uh, basically. So that reserve wave did not, uh, did not profit from being the reserve wave at all. It was a disadvantage. So everybody, as I said, eight airplanes are lost, 11 return to 617 Squadron uh, Airfield at Scampton. If I've ever wanted anything in terms of collectibles, it was about 15 years ago, but it was just too big. Uh, when they were redoing stuff at Scampton, there was a wall of a building where all the pilots of the 617 Squadron had, uh, in a commemorative sort of manner, had signed cigarette packets and, and attached them to this big wall. Uh, they literally cut that wall out as they were redoing that stuff Everybody, including Guy Gibson, over the years had signed all these things, and they were basically selling that wall uh, that all the pilots had put their cigarette wrappers, signed cigarette wrappers on. I wanted that so bad, I did not have a wall big enough to hold it. Uh, it sold for quite a number of thousands of dollars, and I'm sure, hopefully it stayed in Britain. It needed to stay in Britain anyway. But uh, long and short is uh, everybody limps back and... and um, And yeah, I, I, I'm going to do another reading because these were young men and sometimes they didn't know all that was in front of them, but after a while they learned enough to know what was in front of them. I want to talk about what it was like to be leaving on this raid from RAF Scampton. Uh, it's not, it's probably not... Uh, unpredictable that a lot of them wrote their wills they needed to leaving stuff to the if they had a wife or to their parents or something because a lot of them knew they weren't going to come back um, uh, I'm going to read now they lay on the grass this is before they left they lay on the grass that night they lay on the grass chatting smoking nursing private thoughts in the beauty of the Lincolnshire evening Gibson described his own sensations at such moments before setting forth on an operation when almost every flyer's anticipation was at its most acute. Your stomach feels as though it wants to hit your backbone. You can't stand still. You laugh at small jokes loudly, stupidly. You smoke far too many cigarettes, usually only halfway through, then you throw them away. Sometimes you feel sick and you want to go to the laboratory. The smallest incidents annoy you and you flare up at the slightest provocation. All of this because you're frightened, scared stiff. Even in Gibson, Fear was there. 
Bill Townsend, a veteran of 26 operations, confessed to feeling sick, convinced that they were all for the chop. John Hopgood told Dave Shannon as they smoked behind the hangar, I think this is going to be a tough one, and I don't think I'm coming back, Dave. This shook Shannon, who urged his friend that having beaten these bastards for so long, he could do it again. Louis Burpee, the musician's son, who knew that his wife was expecting their first baby, shook the hand of fellow Canadian Ken Brown, saying, Goodbye, Ken, with undisguised finality. Brown's rear gunner spoke confidently about the occupants of other aircraft who shared their bus to the dispersals. You know those two crews aren't coming back, don't you? Many men of bomber command on many nights experienced such premonitions, and most went unfulfilled until the last time. And as I said, the, the numbers uh, coming up meant that there would be a last time at some point in time. And so uh, just understand what, what, uh, what was being felt by those men at that, young men at that time. Um, I think I'm done, ex except to say 617 um, continued to exist. Uh, when the battleship Tirpitz was bombed, it was 617 Squadron that, that destroyed the Tirpitz. Uh, as I said, three-fourths of those men in that raid never survived the war, including Guy Gibson. Gibson went on, a, on an American and Canadian promotional tour, wrote, wrote a book, uh, in, Enemy Coast, uh, uh, trying to remember the name of the book. It's uh, Enemy Coast Ahead, I think, was the name of the book. Uh, in 44, he was killed flying a, uh, flying a fighter plane instead of a bomber. But um, the sad part of this story, the good part is it was hugely important to British morale. It was hugely important that Churchill be able to report some kind of something uh, to the Americans whose support he was looking for so diligently. Um, it was an important raid, and it did destroy German war capacity for a while, even at the cost of the lives, even the lives of the, the forced slaves who were killed. But it, 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 it was worth the effort, uh, if for nothing else than just to be able to say we fought back effectively. The sad part of the ending of the Operation Chastise has nothing to do with the pilots. It has to do with the fact that the Germans under Albert Speer, who was chief of uh, munitions and the ar Hitler's architect, they were able to rebuild this stuff pretty quickly. Uh, Speer never understood as they were rebuilding the Mona Dam why the British did not come back and drop bombs on the, on the wooden structures they were using to rebuild that dam and lay the masonry. Uh, they just, they did not follow up. And one of the reasons probably uh, was that uh, Arthur Harris, Bomber Harris, uh, was really most um, consumed by the mass bombing air war over Europe. Um, it, you know, the, August of that year, I, I was in Hamburg, Germany, probably a, a year ago or so, May of last year, and some of the old churches there that they left unrestored from the bombing raids. In one night in August of 1943, 41,000 Germans were killed in a, a night raid of the British RAF. Uh, Harris just saw that as, as the way to bring Germany to its feet. Uh, whether or not that was effective in the final analysis, who knows. Portal did not, his superior actually did not believe that, but did not rein him in because the bombings were so successful. Uh, Portal always believed that you needed to strategically bomb, pinpoint bombing, uh, even though that was not always uh, quite available to the RAF in their night bombing efforts. But uh, Portal always uh, had a little queasiness about the mass bombing of German civilians and cities. Uh, Harris believed in it. And so if you're killing 41,000 Germans and decimating Hamburg in August, uh, whether or not you're going to fly somebody back to try to disable the reconstruction of the Mona Dam was no longer in, in Harris's sights. And so... So the fact was, German war capacity got built back fairly quickly. And, and one of the great scandals of World War II, I, I guess we can't call it a scandal, we just didn't know how to do it, was that, was that the British never quite, nor the Americans, never quite were able to 
fully digest where the German war industries really were and hit them. I mean, we did, we hit ball bearing factories and we hit this and we hit that and, and, and later the, the rocket sites and things. But they were able to disguise their industries in a way that we weren't always able to bomb uh, the vital industries. We didn't know where they were. And so the, the bad part of all of this is uh, that, that uh, you know, it had great public effect it did have some effect, but it was not a crushing blow to the Germans in the, in the final analysis. Um, uh, but, it, but it was a rip-roaring good raid that, that uh, brought British uh, morale much, much higher at a time that they really needed to have that. Um, now, the only last thing I'd say is, is there's a postscript, and it's a one-man postscript, and that is uh, um, George Johnson, Johnny Johnson is the last surviving member of that air crew. He is now, he will soon be 99 years old. So one man remains. I, I felt kind of bad uh, less than a year ago when, uh, uh, when the last member of the Doolittle Raid finally died, uh, the Doolittle Raid of, of Tokyo. Uh, but there's one left from the Dam Busters Raid, and it's, it's George Johnny Johnson, and, and he's still alive, and hopefully will be alive a few months from now to celebrate the 70, the final 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Although for the British, really in most cases, World War II ended this last, in May of 1945, when the war in Europe was over with. So uh, a ripping good raid, and, and I hope we can do the Doolittle Raid maybe as a follow-up, because it's another one of those great stories of, of attacks that really are morale builders. So thanks, uh, see you later.